It is finally that time of the year again where I get to make some more NBA mock draft videos. This time, obviously, with the 2024 NBA draft. And I got to say, this is definitely by far the hardest mock draft I've really had to cover because there's no real, like, I think, number one pick that's a clear number one that every single person has in their mind not just that i think everyone's mock draft legitimately like changes every single day so i'm kind of scared that by the time i actually do release this video that my my mock draft might have even changed a little bit and it also doesn't help that detroit and washington are currently battling for the number one overall pick on the standings at the moment of course we don't know what the official draft lottery does, does look like at the time of making this video. So I will just be going off based with the standings at the moment. And again, at the time of making this video, the Detroit Pistons do have the first overall pick. Well, I do have them taking Zachary Rashad. Hold on, scratch that. I definitely mispronounced his name. Zachary Rasache, I should say. Again, there's a lot of like foreign players in this draft who have, to me, some funky names that are definitely perfectly normal from where they come from. Again, they probably think my name's pretty funky over there. But again, Zachary Rasache is an extremely good player. It's definitely a battle of him and Alexander Saar, I think, for this first overall pick. And I think if Washington had pick one, they probably would take Saar. So it kind of works out with, of course, the Pistons at the time making this video, having one where they will take Rasache, who is a six foot nine, six foot ten, extremely versatile small forward who has definitely jumped in the draft ranks as I think the weeks have really gone on. He does have a couple of different NBA comparisons, one, of course, being Franz Wagner. He excels at creating space for his shot. He has an extremely deadly step back where he can also hit a really good jump shot from that as well. Again, an extremely good open core athlete who offensive talent is just really, really good. He's been said to have one of the best shooting strokes in this whole entire draft while also being able to be a very good ball handler. With his extremely good ball handling, it also is said that he can be a pretty good uh, passer and playmaker, and he's also pretty good on the defensive end. And this just works really, really well for the Detroit Pistons, who will definitely be looking to add a couple more wings and forwards, I think, in this offseason, considering they've presumably already got Asar Thompson and Jalen Duran in that starting five, who already aren't good three-point shooters at all. I think they definitely need to add some spacing into that lineup. They did obviously also lose Boyan Bogdanovich in the trade deadline to the New York Knicks. So again, they're, they're definitely going to be looking for, I think, quite a bit of spacing and quite a bit of three-point shooting. Considering we don't really know what a Saar Thompson ceiling is, is going to be like, will he just be an elite defender in that starting lineup? We're not too sure. And even if that is the case, you still kind of do take that. And just adding a guy like this who can not only take, I think, some of the playmaking potentially and ball handling, of course, off Cade Cunningham and just giving them another option on that side of the ball, he also can help out with the defense, which Detroit have been pretty notable on for having ever since their inception in the NBA. Of course, that has dropped off in the recent couple of years, but I definitely think Detroit are really going to try and get back to that. And with the Asar Thompson pick last year and the new potential pick this year, I think Zachary uh, Rasache really does just come in and he kind of feels every single void uh, that they really do need to fill. Maybe not straight away, but I think the ceiling for this dude could obviously be a really good NBA star. And potentially, I mean, 
a, another option to add to Cade Cunningham, who will obviously also hopefully be an all-star for them in the future as well. So I really like this pick for the Detroit Pistons, and I think it just makes a lot of sense in terms of, again, filling that spacing need, adding another shot creator who can also help out on the defensive end. He can ball handle as well. Again, there's not exactly that much that Rasache really can't do. So I think this makes a ton of sense and would really build on to their low-key impressive young core that's kind of building in Detroit right now. With the second overall pick, we do have the Washington Wizards who are really now starting to hit this full rebuild mode, which I think is a, it's definitely a long time coming. And they're definitely adding some really, really nice pieces. And it so does happen that with the second overall pick, I think there is a perfect player for them here who is going to help out so much on this team if they do, of course, decide to draft them. A guy who I think could possibly be the first overall pick, depending how this goes, is, of course, Alexander Saar, who, in my opinion, I do think is possibly the best player uh, in this draft class. He is a seven foot one power forward slash center who just came off a season with the Perth Wildcats in the NBL, who I think are kind of renowned as the greatest Australian basketball team that we have seen so far. He had an extremely impressive season for them, really quickly becoming one of the best defenders in the whole entire league, which has already been noted to be one of the best defend, uh, defending leagues in the whole entire world. Again, there's a lot of different names that people are kind of throwing, you know, as this guy with a comparison. I think this guy plays a bit like Evan Mobley. Again, in terms of being a dude who I don't necessarily know is 100% a center, similar to how Mobley has come into the NBA. He was kind of drafted as a center, but with the Cavs already having Jarrett Allen, they moved him to power forward. And because he was so versatile at defending the perimeter, he's actually done really, really well there. Again, Alexander Saar is really like that as well. Again, extremely versatile defender that is so elite at getting up to the perimeter and switching on those plays. And with a season in the NBL, a league that is so known for defense with so many elite defensive coaches, you can already tell that it has severely improved him so much more to being a, again, one of the best, if not the best defender in this draft class. He also has an extremely good mid-range. And again, I haven't really even talked about this yet, but is really, really good on offense. The guy moves like a wing, like legitimately. Like that's the best part of him. Not only does he move like a wing on defense, this dude moves like a wing on offense. Extremely good mid-range shot. Really good in the paint. Again, his three-point shot, Obviously, similar to Evan Mobley, might need definitely some work here and there. But you definitely see like attributes where this dude could hopefully become a three-point shooter. Again, typically, if you've got a really good mid-range, that's already a great stepping stone. And you just can't tell me this dude wouldn't be the most perfect player to add to the Washington Wizards team as they stand. I think the Wizards legitimately need like a lot at most positions right now, especially the center position after they, of course, got rid of, you know, Daniel Gafford and made a couple other moves. There's definitely a massive hole right there at center. And I mean, even powerful, like they, they could definitely use a guy who could switch on both of those positions. Now, would will he be a center straight away? I'm not too sure. On most teams, he would probably start at power forward, but with how the Wizards are going right now, uh, again, they probably can afford to put him at the center position and let him develop, you know, there quite well. And again, with how with how he is going in the NBA right now, the fact that he's seven foot one and can guard the perimeter to an elite level, he's going to work so well in the NBA. I think he's got like Evan Mobley, in my opinion, 
kind of written all over him in terms of how he plays. And I think if you're the Washington Wizards, you are going to absolutely love that. Again, he really does fill in a ton of holes that they, of course, need to fill. And I do think this might be a semi long rebuild for the Wizards. I think they definitely need to hit another draft or two after this one. But yeah, Alexander Saar is an elite start for them. And I think, in my opinion, he is the best player in the draft. Uh, of course, I didn't have him at one just because I think uh, Rosace really does fit a lot more needs that the Pistons have. But both players are like neck and neck for that first overall pick. And I think if you manage to get him as the Washington Wizards, this is a, yeah, this is a terrific move for them. Now, with the third overall pick, we have the San Antonio Spurs. And this is definitely one of the hardest picks to do because we know that in a lot of draft, the Spurs don't traditionally take the most common player that everyone has them taking other than Victor Wenbanyama. Of course, Jeremy Sohan was a, was a definitely an interesting pick, such a Spurs player. Um, again, not a lot of people had him going at nine, but I think if you knew how the Spurs really drafted and went about their game plan, then yeah, it made a ton of sense. So I really had to like kind of take that into factor while I think doing this mock draft with the San Antonio Spurs. And with all that being said and done, I actually do think with the third overall pick, they might select Nikola Topic, who is definitely a really hard one to grade because I think a couple of weeks ago would have been a very logical pick three. But as you guys have probably heard, a couple of reports here and there have had him sliding to like five and six. I still think he makes a ton of sense to have on this San Antonio Spurs team, considering he does a lot of really, really good things that they need. They, of course, like to bring in their foreign players as well. He is an elite playmaker with great passing vision and great instincts. I really do think this is the type of guy who would be a really awesome player to have with Weminyama long-term and also have as his point guard. Not only is he an elite playmaker who, again, is extremely versatile with all of that. He actually has a pretty good looking three-point stroke as well, and he's a pretty nice defender. Also, being listed at six foot six to six foot seven, depending on what page you, of course, are looking at, this guy should be able to, again, switch one through three, definitely on both of those guards. I just think this makes a ton of sense for the San Antonio Spurs. In my opinion, Trey Jones is a good point guard. I like Trey Jones, but I think he would be better served as a backup point guard in the league, especially at the moment. Again, he has improved, I think, a fair bit this season, but I think it's time now to bring in a dude who can be a really, really good playmaker for this team, an absolute floor general who also fits into the defensive system that the San Antonio Spurs have wanted to do quite a bit. And something that I actually really like about this toe pitch pick as well is I think one of the best things about the San Antonio Spurs right now is that I think they have a decent amount of shot creators, right? They've got Wembenyama, they've got Vassell, and of course they've got Kelvin Johnson who has semi been moved to a bit of a six-man type of role. But you got those three really good shot creators, I think, on this team. Of course, you would maybe like a fourth or so, but I think you can possibly find that in free agency. I think the best part about Topic is, is this guy, I think, can play not only off ball, but I don't think he needs the ball in his hands to be a really good player. I don't think he needs to be a shot creator on this team, considering they've already got all of those guys to do that role. I think if Vassell, Johnson, and Weminyama had a really good playmaker who could also go and be a three-point shooter, that would really do a lot of good to this San Antonio Spurs team. I just think this makes a ton of sense in terms of that. And if you know, if, if they really want to get back to that old Greg Popovich style of being one of the best, if not the best defensive teams uh, in the league, I think Topic, you know, helps that as well as he is a versatile defender who is also six foot six, six foot seven, 
who can possibly, of course, switch, I think, not only in the one and two, but hopefully on, you know, the, the other three as well. Again, this dude is also, as I said, not only tall, but he is a pretty big dude who has a lot of strength. Again, his defensive ability is really, really good. Decent three-point shooter, can play make. He's good around the rim as well and can draw contact in the lane, being a pretty good creative finisher around the rim. Uh, again, he might not be the most like elite, I think, first step kind of guy. And his burst isn't necessarily that good. Of course, being a taller point guard, it might come with him being a little bit slower uh, than most point guards in the NBA. Yeah, this is just a great pick by the San Antonio Spurs. And I definitely think this could be the decision they, of course, do decide to go with. Now, with the fourth overall pick, we have the Charlotte Hornets, who I think get a, a lot of unnecessary hate at the moment. I think they're actually building something pretty good there with Lamelo Ball and, uh, of course, a couple other dudes on this team as well. And I think another guy they could really, really definitely add is actually Cody Williams, who a lot of people have you know, kind of in the top three as well. He's actually the younger brother of OKC wing Jalen Williams, which for some reason I didn't know. I don't know why I didn't know this, but I have seen people legitimately having this guy at pick one, and I think he could make a case there. I also think, though, this guy just fits in really, really well with the Charlotte Hornets roster. Again, he is a six foot eight wing slash forward who... I think, again, as I said, has pick one kind of written all over him right now. I definitely have seen it right now. I think he fits in with Brandon Miller and potentially Miles Bridges. It would be a very tall one to four man rotation. Lamelo being like 6'7", Bridges like 6'7", 6'8", Brandon Miller's like 6'8", Cody Williams is like 6'8". This dude is the ideal size for a wing. Has really, really good length as well. He'll be able to switch from the two to the four. He's even had comparisons to Tracy McGrady with one website saying he's Tracy McGrady all over, except he's just, again, not as uh, explosive when it comes to his verticality. But this dude is a really great uh, rebounder, really good with the ball in his hands, can run an offense by himself. Uh, again, his playmaking is pretty decent as well. Extremely good at getting to the rim and driving there. He also ha has that really good ability of just being able to drive while also kicking it out, kind of collapsing the defense there. The other thing is too, not only is his offense pretty good, but he can also be a really, really good defender, being listed as one of the best two-way players in this draft right now. Again, I would say he could definitely be a top three defender in this draft while being a top five player offensively as well. Oddly enough, something that a lot of people as well don't talk about is this guy seems to be a pretty decent three-point shooter, I believe, actually averaging around 41% in his college season right now, which I feel like no one has even brought up like I'm reading a lot of these scouting reports on him and no one's kind of talking about his three-point shot being 41% which is pretty interesting so it will definitely see how that does go to the NBA but right now I do actually think he makes a ton of sense for this Charlotte Hornets team I think this Charlotte Hornets team could quickly become one of the most athletic squads in the game with of course Cody Williams, Brandon Miller, LaMelo Ball and Miles Bridges, that is, yeah, that is pretty crazy. Again, some people might argue that the three-point shooting of this team might be a little bit hit or miss, but again, I know that Miles Bridges can sometimes not be the greatest three-point shooter. I guess Jalen Williams has a question mark on his three-point shooting, which I don't know how. 41% from three is pretty good. Their center, whoever they have at center, whether it's Nick Richards or whatever. Um, <laughs> it, it probably can't shoot, obviously. And then Lamelo, I still think is a good shooter, but people would beg to differ. I disagree on that though. Again, I guess I'm just a bit of a fan of this Charlotte Hornets team and I think they're low-key kind of underrated. And with enough 
building blocks and players like uh, I think Cody Williams being added to this team, I don't see why it couldn't become really good. And I still think this team could be one of the best defensively in the NBA with literally everyone on this team starting five probably being over six foot seven next season if they do decide to draft Cody Williams. So again, that is what it is. The fifth overall pick now, we have the Portland Trailblazers. And I hope everyone forgives me if I pronounce this guy's name wrong because I have heard about 18 different pronunciations of, you know, in my lifetime of this dude's last, of this, it's not only his last name, but his first name, but that's actually Martez Bazilis. Now, this guy is also playing for the G League Ignite, which does look like it probably won't be a thing next season, I believe. But again, that's still a late competition having to play in the G League. There is a ton of really good players in the G League, like Sharif Cooper, who just aren't NBA level, but are elite of the elite basketballers in the world. And that's the competition Bazilis has to really go against. Again, this dude is a six foot 10 small forward who is an extremely, I think, big wing. I've seen some people say this dude could possibly play a bit of shooting guard. I'm not exactly too sure, but considering this guy's got great handles and elite court vision as well, he is great with the ball in his hands. And one of his big, I think, notable things about his play is when he's on the court, the ball movement and the flow on offense looks absolutely crisp as well. Again, he's played on the ball a lot. A lot of people are actually comparing him a bit to Michael Porter Jr. A bit of like a prime Gordon Hayward as well. Uh, really, really good offensive player. Just like those guys. Again, really smooth and promising three-point shot. Uh, that could be absolutely elite in the NBA. Again, some of the question marks on this guy is some people are saying... Will he just be an elite role player like what Michael Porter Jr. has become? Or could he maybe develop into being what like Gordon Hayward was when he was that all-star kind of caliber player? Again, he does have a bit of a thin frame, uh, pretty skinny kind of guy. But again, get him in the gym, you know, get, get some KFC into this guy or something. I'm not too sure. And he will be, I think he will definitely bulk up for the NBA as well. This dude is just really awesome to watch on offense. So, like, just watching him space the floor with his three-point shooting while also being elite with his ball handling when he does have it. Of course, the flow of offense when this guy is on there as well and just the ability he has, again, with every offensive tool, being a, again, a nice floor spacer. I still think this guy can develop into being a pretty good shot creator like what Michael Porter Jr. and Gordon Hayward has well. He's really good all-around game. I think he can find the right player and be a nice playmaker as well. That kind of coincides with the good ball handling that he does have. I also think he would be a pretty good player, though, to add to this Portland Trailblazers team. Again, I saw someone the other day that said that Scoot H uh, Henderson actually broke the record for, like, the worst plus minus. A lot of people are saying he's the worst player in the NBA. I really do disagree with this, and I think any Portland fan worrying should not. He's going to be, hopefully, a really, really good player in the NBA, and Bazilla's coming into this team, I think, makes a ton of sense as well. Being a really good, solid role player who can help boost this offense on this squad, at you know, Scoot Henderson kind of rolling with him and maybe being his playmaker would be a really awesome sight to see. I can just imagine right now Scoot Henderson driving, getting into trouble, kicking it out, and he'll have Bazilis there right on that three-point line. Jeremy Grant also potentially there next season as well. I think Grant and Bazilis could be a pretty good one-two punch at that four positions. And look, there's bright spots on this Trailblazers team. Duop Wraith looking like a really good player as well. DeAndre Ayton getting better and better as the season has gone on. Again, I think it just give this Trailblazers team some time, a couple more trades here and there. And I think this rebuild might go a little bit quicker than what a lot of people do have them at. Again, it might take another draft or two, but I think Bazoulas kind of 
adds a lot to this team and helps boost, I think, their offense and potentially makes Scoot Henderson an even better player than he already is. With his sixth overall pick, which of course at the time making this video does currently belong to the Toronto Raptors. And again, the Raptors have always been, I feel like a harder team to draft from in the last couple of years because they could take absolutely any position because I feel like they've got a lot of really decent players in their starting five, like Scotty Barnes, AJ, RJ Barrett, sorry. Uh, again, Emmanuel Quickly, etc. who uh, again are pretty decent in their respective positions. Of course, their bench is definitely one of the more weak ones in the league. So with this pick though, I did just kind of think, well, let's just go with who I think is best available, which is Robert Dillingham, who is arguably the best point guard in this draft so far. Again, of course, I did have Nikola Topic going at pick four, who I do believe is probably, is maybe the best, but also fits what the Spurs needed at that pick. But again, the Raptors really can't go wrong with Dillingham. I really don't think at this pick. Again, he is an elite player when it comes to his speed and athleticism. Great ball handler who was extremely crafty and great at losing defenders with his insanely quick dribble moves. He's a great playmaker with just insanely good court vision, very capable of executing really high speed plays. He also happens to be one of the best shot creators in this draft and puts a ton of effort into both ends of the court. A couple downsides can potentially be his defense sometimes is not exactly great, although again, puts in a fair bit of effort. It is said that he can get pushed off pretty easily and can be used as a mismatch target, which does scare me a little bit because Toronto, I feel like have kind of, I think, really based themselves off having great defense in the previous couple years. But with some new coaching here and there, you can tell they're really trying to, I think, embrace a new offensive game style. And I think Dillingham works really well with this Raptors team because I look at this Raptors team right now and I see a lot of really, really good things. But one thing I don't see a whole lot of is playmaking. Again, Scotty Barnes, I think is a really underrated ball handler and playmaker and he's going to get better and better with that every year. Emmanuel Quickly is definitely much more of a, you know, shot first, I think shot created kind of guy. But Dillingham, not only is he a great shot creator, but he's extremely quick and he's a very good pass of the ball, who I think is going to work really, really well with a couple of these Raptors players. Again, it's going to be interesting to see how they handle this because they might already think that Emmanuel Quickly is, of course, their future point guard, which I do expect could be the case. But I have no reason to say that maybe both of these guys couldn't potentially start together at the guards. Again, I don't really see too many reasons not to try potentially both of these guys together. And it's really like, well, whoever you draft at this pick is probably going to be a position they almost already have, you know, filled. Like if they were to draft the center, well, you've already got Jakob Pertl there. If you're going to draft the forward, well, you've already got RJ Barrett and you've already got Scotty Barnes. I just figured they probably need another guard. I'm not exactly too sure what the long-term future is of Emmanuel Quickly at that point guard position, even though I actually have liked what I've seen on the Raptors. I think it is time to bring in a guy who can really play make and of course be an awesome passer to a guy like Scotty Barnes. And I think that Dillingham does that really, really well. Again, a ton of great things to like about him. And his only knock is he might, you know, not be exactly the greatest defender, but honestly, at the point guard position at six foot two in the NBA, I definitely feel like he will be able to settle in with that. And again, we've seen Emmanuel quickly as well have a lot of experience at playing the shooting guard. I just think this this pick makes a ton of sense. He's the, definitely the best player available with this pick, and I really do think the Raptors it'd be awesome for them to finally bring in a playmaker. And a dude who can, of course, you know, not only do that, but shot create as well, which would be something really awesome to help out, of course, Scotty Barnes. With the, with the sixth overall pick, I will, of course, have the Toronto Raptors selecting Robert Dillingham. And now with the seventh overall pick, 
we of course do have the memphis grizzlies now again the grizzlies have had a very interesting year which has earned them quite a high pick and i actually think there's a really good player for them available with this selection and that is of course zach Eady, who has been absolutely awesome for quite a while now again he just recently came off the march madness championship game where he absolutely dominated again unfortunately for him was not able to get the win over yukon but uh, of course i believe i saw somewhere where he scored like 62 percent of their points and of course i think it was like 37 this dude is an absolutely beast scorer being a seven foot four center who i think really does uh, fit into this grizzlies team he also fills in the positional need that i think they do have based off center it's really hard to know if jaron jackson jr will be a center in the nba if he will remain as a power forward as sometimes he's looked good at center so far this season for the grizzlies but other times it's like he's just uh, i don't really know he get definitely gets caught out by some certain centers even though he's a really good interior defender again zach Eady is really compared to a couple of really awesome players over the nba's time including yao ming kind of being his ceiling it's being said that he's like yao ming just with less mobility which i, I guess is a really kind of weird comparison um again obviously for yao ming's size and height he was pretty mobile but again compared to other nba players not so much it's being said that Edie has really nice hands and a good touch around the rim he finishes extremely solid and has developed into being a really good free throw shooter shooting over 70 percent he's also not only seven foot four but he's an extremely big seven foot four being over 300 pounds which is actually bigger than boban Mojanovic, which to think is absolutely insane he's also said to be one of the best defenders in the nba being able to clog any lane and he alters absolutely every shot he sees again watching him in some of these college games this dude is an absolutely massive shot blocking machine like if you are in a 10 meter radius from this guy he will be absolutely huge and will block you <laughs> so bad that it'll be an embarrassing and you end up on a highlight reel one of the knocks on zach Eady that i've heard some people say is he's of course obviously extremely good you know at the college level and i think this is the knock that i've got him taking at seven with again i've seen a lot of people have this guy go at like pick three in their mock draft but some of the knocks have been said is will he be able to fit in today's nba being so tall and being so big will he of course be able to do it again he is not exactly the fastest guy out there and will definitely not be able to get to the perimeter at all but the realistic thing is if you put this guy in of course in the paint he will be absolutely dominant and i, I really do look at a guy like this and i think well is there a guy out there in the nba and there's not exactly too many names, but a guy I know is, of course, being Rudy Gobert, who I think Rudy Gobert garnered that much hate that he actually ended up becoming underrated, and we've now seen what he has been able to do with Minnesota this, of course, most recent season. Uh, again, I feel like Zach Eady is kind of like Rudy Gobert, where he can't exactly be that great of getting to the perimeter, but he is unstoppable when it comes to the paint and can also be a decent i think pick and roll player which people don't talk about gobert is actually not that bad in people just think that gobert has no offensive game whatsoever which is just untrue again zach Eady is a huge guy who's definitely going to get a rebound when needed he will be one of the best defenders of course in this whole entire draft and we've seen he is an absolutely massive scoring machine scoring of course 37 points in his most recent college game so look i think having a guy with like him with jaron jackson is so scary like having both of those dudes as these really massive elite defenders will definitely be something that i think could actually work and it's kind of what like minnesota are doing right now with cat and go bear and Cavs have done with mobley and allen lakers previously with 
of course, Anthony Davis and JaVale McGee. This could definitely be the best out of, you know, all of them if it does, of course, work well. Will he translate to the NBA? I'm not too sure. But this guy is putting double doubles left, right, and center in college, seven foot four, and an extremely good defender. So I guess you can only try. And I think with how Memphis have credited themselves with massive defensive teams over the past couple of years, why not give it a go? So that's why I think this pick, of course, does make sense. Now, with the eighth overall pick, we have the Utah Jazz. And you can basically pick any position for these guys. They're looking for quite a fair bit, of course. They got a really good and awesome young core on that team so far, but are definitely looking to add some guys here. And with a couple of the different positional needs, but also looking at their best, uh, you know, the, the best player available, I have actually gone with Donovan Klingon from, of course, Yukon or Klingon, sorry, who is a seven foot two center who absolutely dominated recently in March Madness, of course, helping the Huskies win it all. He is an extremely good big who I think has jumped in a lot of mock drafts as of recently. It is being said he's a great rim, prote uh, rim protector with great touch around the rim. Oddly enough, actually a pretty solid passer for a big man. He's a great rebounder, where, whether it's offensive or defensive, and a pretty efficient scorer. Of course, there have always been downsides with certain centers like this. It's being said he's not a good switchable defender, not a good shooter, which I don't see as an issue. And uh, of course, really in today's NBA, where even though shooting is pretty necessary, I still think there are a lot of centers who can't shoot, who are extremely good. Again, players like Jarrett Allen, who aren't exactly the greatest shooters out there that just do the job day and night and are very, very good. And Klingon is, of course, currently being compared to Steven Adams and Jakob Pertl, who both players have severely gone underrated in their careers thus far. And I still think have a lot of really good years under their belt to do quite a fair good amount of things. I just think this pick makes a lot of sense right now for the Utah Jazz as they're definitely looking for who their future center is going to be in the NBA. Again, for a long time, it looked like Walker Kessler was going to be their center. And then of course, they decided not to start Kessler throughout a ton of games this year, preferably for them playing John Collins at that starting center position. Then I've even seen after Collins, I've seen them go pretty small ball and play Larry Markinen at that center position as well, who again is not small, obviously being seven foot, but just doesn't really, of course, play like a center at all. He plays a lot like a small forward or power forward in today's game. So they're definitely out and about looking for who I think their future starting center is, of course, going to be. And with Donovan Klingon just succeeding really, really well as of late and averaging a really respectable, I believe, 13 points per game and seven and a half rebounds. Not only can he do all of that, but this guy is doing a ton of other things like, of course, his defense being pretty respectable. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where this guy goes. I've seen ESPN actually have him ranked at number three, while a lot of other drafting you know, websites do have him ranked at around 10 to 12. I've, of course, kind of met in the middle here, having him at eight, but I do think he just makes a ton of sense for this Utah Jazz team. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Kessler in the future. I think there's been some minor trade talks. I'm not exactly too sure what's going to be going on there. Again, Kessler, I think his ceiling is a lot lower than what a guy like Klingans probably or Klingons probably is. So it's going to be kind of really interesting to see how this, of course, does go. But again, the man just dominated in what will be most likely his final season, of course, of college, putting up excellent stats, being a great defender, being a pretty decent passer as well. And of course, taking the Huskies to the promised land. So you really can't ask for anything more like that. Getting an absolutely massive proven winner who did actually, of course, take down my previous pick, Zach Eady, in, of course, the championship game. But again, I still kind of give Eady the edge for now. 
of course he did have a insane game and it's just proved to be a little bit better but again some might argue that Klingon might actually of course convert to the NBA a little bit better than 80 which I think of course Utah Jazz fans will be very excited to hear as I do have them taking him with the eighth overall pick but moving on now to pick number nine we have the Houston Rockets who I definitely debated between about five different players who I would have them taking again it, de it definitely went through my mind could they have gone with the Reed Shepard maybe not they've already got Van Vliet and a couple other different point guards could they have gone with a Filipowski maybe not again they're pretty good on the center position there's definitely a ton of players they could potentially take here but I decided to go with another wing slash forward in Dalton Knight who has really really boosted his draft stock as of recent again kind of doing very very well in college as he's an elite shooter a very solid athlete who will likely be able to contribute to the NBA straight away already being around 22 years old I believe an extremely great finisher around the rim elite in transition he gets down the floor before anyone else and is extremely effective at finishing plays at high speeds again some might argue his defense might not be the greatest thing at this rate but definitely has improved uh you know as he has gone on some of the comparisons i've seen are actually calling him a little bit taller a little bit of a better defender of course than what norman powell is powell being an incredibly underrated i think you know play oh not play maker, sorry three-point shooter and role player that's what i was trying to say for a very long time again doing really well in the clippers this season putting himself in six-man contention. I think this is something like Knight could, of course, do on this Houston Rockets team. He averaged 21.7 points per game for Tennessee. Again, having a game where he scored 37 points with a field goal of 13 out of 17, getting his six rebounds, of course. I think he just comes in really well and adds to what I think this Houston Rockets team is of course trying to do i believe as well this rockets team might be even a little bit weaker on you know natural wings as of this point again you got you got guys like van vliet um and, and of course jalen green who are just the, the natural guards armin thompson is a guy who you're gonna hope is gonna be able to guard one through three uh as he progresses on in his nba career but as of like their their wings slash small forwards they don't have i don't think really a whole lot you got dylan brooks of course there cam whitmore who hasn't really you know he's played some decent games so far in the nba but again we haven't seen the best of him and then of course just sean tate who we really don't know if he will be on this houston rockets roster next year i think there is a massive hole right now for this team to of course go out and get some wings slash small forwards and can i obviously not only is he a great scorer, but he's also a great shooter. So when you have guys like, you know, Van Vliet uh, trying to play make, and, you know, of course, Jalen Green trying to shot create, we know Jalen Green, unfortunately, can get himself into trouble uh, at the wrong times. And having a guy to kick it out to, like Knight, who obviously, again, has been proven to be a really, really great shooter so far, and also a decent shot creator. I think this is one that makes very, uh, you know, very much a lot of sense. Again, other scouts say he projects very clearly to the NBA level and has an NBA-ready game. It's extremely easy to imagine having an impact from day one as a floor spacer wing who can also score in isolation. He's got a beautiful jumper, rises up with a ton of confidence and can carry the load on the offensive end. He's an explosive athlete in the lane and can drop the hammer on defenders with highlight reel dunks. Again, as I said earlier though, the only knock so far on him is that he is considered to not be exactly the greatest defender. So a lot of really interesting things to, uh, of course, talk about him some slight bad things but i think adding this guy as a backup shooting guard a backup small forward a backup small ball power forward there's definitely a lot that the Houston rockets can really do right here and i think this pick makes a ton of sense for them 
With the 10th overall pick now, we do of course have the Atlanta Hawks who, I mean, they're definitely going to be going off best available. They're going to have a really interesting offseason. I'm super keen to see who gets traded from this team and who stays. They're actually low-key building though, I think still a pretty impressive young core that no one really talks about, which is pretty unfortunate. But it so happens there is a guy right now available at this pick who it's going to be really interesting to see how he goes to the NBA and how he converts. Will he be really good? I'm not sure, but I do know he could be an absolute huge steal for them if so. And that is, of course, Ron Holland. Again, I think people forget that this guy at one stage had people talking about him being a potential pick one of this draft. Of course, he is a six foot eight small forward slash power forward. Ranked by some places at 12, ranked by other websites at 6. Again, I've got him going near in the middle of number 10. Of course, he's being said to be one of the most well-rounded athletes in this draft class. He's extremely fast, he's strong, and he can jump out of the gym with great hops. He has the ideal frame for a wing slash forward in the NBA, being 6 foot 8 with long arms and a lot of muscle. He's an elite scorer in transition, gets down the court fast great mover off the ball he's a great driver and an extremely good finisher around the rim and of course he's a really really good perimeter defender who can stay in front of his man and contain anyone from bigger guards to big forwards again unfortunately there are of course some downsides i mean i've said everything that's so great about this guy there's just a lot of things that aren't good and i think that's where he's i think his rank of potentially being a pick one kind of dropped but of course it being said he's not a great passer he can be turnover prone so just potentially sometimes not good in the with the ball in his hands his three-point shot isn't consistent at the time making this video and of course of course his shot creation can also be a little bit inconsistent but again i think with maturity leadership and coaching especially in the nba where not necessarily everything is on your shoulders like it might be for him to be the number one man like it is for him where he actually plays in the NBA G League Ignite team. I think going to the NBA and playing with a guy like Trey Young who still does not get the recognition he deserves as a really good shot creator and shooter who is also very calm and steady with the ball in his hands. I think going and working under a guy like that, working under a guy like DeJounte Murray and some good coaching, underrated coaching potentially from Quinn Snyder as well. There's no reason that a guy who is already an elite off-ball player who can be very good with the ball in his hands, great driver, great finisher, a great perimeter defender, which is always extremely handy in the NBA, a great scorer. There's no reason why all of that, you know, it can't be can't can't be something really good in the NBA. And again, turning the ball over and not being a good passer, that can sometimes suck, but that can be extremely really easily fixed in the NBA with just composure and coaching. So I think you can already write those two off. Again, the ones that concern me is his shot creation being inconsistent, three-point shot not being good. It's definitely not great. But again, I think he can absolutely learn and there's no reason why uh, he, he couldn't do and be a very good player, of course, in the NBA. So again, I think it makes a lot of sense for the Atlanta Hawks to make this selection. You obviously, while doing this pick as well, I think it gives you more room to see what you want to do with your other players. You know, some players like... DeAndre Hunter have been on the trade market. Kevin Herter previously was one of those guys. A couple other players here and there might join that conversation. But even if they don't, they still need depth at that wing position anyway. And look, will he start, especially even straight away? Probably not. Will he ever start? Yeah, maybe. But the thing is right now, you're adding a really good young player who has pick one potential over him. And at one stage, was supposed to be that guy to come in and add depth and already join this already pretty decent Atlanta Hawks team that just really suffers from not having much depth. Again, it's got a decent starting five, a couple extra things here and there to add. I think it can be a pretty solid team. And I think that, you know, 
adding a guy like Ron Holland does fix a lot of their issues. With the 11th overall pick, we do have the Chicago Bulls who, again, I think have been one of the most unluckiest teams in the NBA. I think people forget when they had Lonzo Ball, they were seriously a threat. And I think we're at one stage like top two in the East a couple of years ago with Lonzo. They had something really good going on with not only Ball, but also Levine and DeRozan. Unfortunately, that's kind of been taken away from them with bad luck through injuries and just other off-court, you know, problems. But I think there is a player here who could definitely really help what the Chicago Bulls are looking for and fits well, really good into what I think they need. And that's actually Stefan Castle, who is a six foot six, six foot seven point guard out of Yukon, who recently just, of course, won March Madness. He is an extremely good player who I've even had some people not only have in the top seven of this draft, but I actually saw one guy, I think, on a podcast say he would take Castle at pick number three just because he believes he has some of the most upside in this class. It is being said that Castle is a big guard who was at his best with the ball in his hands and using his impressive array of moves to get into the lane to score or make plays for his teammates. He's a dynamic athlete with a quick first step, a lot of shake and bake, and has a great feel for knocking defenders off balance. Again, his outside shot doesn't look that good. In fact, it's not consistent at all. Some even saying he likely won't be a great three-point shooter, which definitely can be a massive issue in the NBA, of course, but there is so much great upsides about him. Again, he's a great finisher around the rim with extremely good and nice touch with an array of decent finishing moves. He's an active defender, not only on ball, but off the ball as well, kind of being a bit of a pest. He's got a great awareness. He disrupts a ton of plays. Again, his offensive ability, not only is he a good ball handler, good around getting to the rim while also being a good solid playmaker. His court vision has greatly improved on execu uh, executing his passes. And uh, again, some are saying could be potentially the best playmaker in the draft. You know, I think Topic has taken that quite easily, but Castle has really improved so much as he has gone on with that, where I think a lot of teams will be looking for that being a massive bonus. Again, as I said, there are some downsides being his three-point shot isn't good. His shooting mechanics on one website actually labels it as being sloppy in terms of his form and the mechanics of that. Apparently, he lacks confidence in scoring, although did improve in the last couple of games. Again, we did see him do pretty well in March Madness. Uh, and again, some saying that he's his overall college season, though, had been a tiny bit inconsistent. Again, you're looking at a guy who has the potential, as mentioned earlier, to be a really high pick in this draft. Is he good enough to be a high pick in this draft? Maybe not top five at the time of making this video, but you really do never know what can be proven at the Combine and uh, other, of course, private trainings that we do know a lot of NBA players have and it's really interesting because if he does manage to go a pick 11 here where I have him to the Chicago Bulls he fits great into this team because I think he kind of picks up where Lonzo Ball of course did leave off Lonzo Ball was a six foot six point guard who was an elite defender who could not only play make but was just very versatile with the ball in his hands he was good around the rim he could finish very well and he was just the ultimate floor general and that's why i think stefan castle might be able to bring to the chicago bulls team if you were to tell him look we don't need you to be a shooter we've got zach levine who has mostly been known to be an elite shooter we've got patrick williams at power four nikola vujovic ton of shooters left right and center arguably one of the best mid-range shooters of all time in demata rosen if he does come back again we don't know about that just yet. A ton of shooters on this team. I think there is definitely enough room for a player to bite the bullet who doesn't need to shoot, who can just play make, be a good ball handler, 
and of course be great on the defensive end. There is no reason why Stefan, you know, Castle couldn't do that for the Chicago Bulls. And if Lonzo Ball does manage to get back, I think a ton of people need to realize that he is not going to be what he previously was, especially at the start. Look, there may be a chance he does get back to being the Lonzo Ball we know. It's very slight, unfortunately, with all the injuries. But again, he's not going to be able to play big minutes, most likely, for a very, very long time. So if he can play the 10 to 15 minutes per night to start off with, that's also good for Castle because he could probably learn a lot from just watching Lonzo Ball in that short amount of time and kind of replicate what Lonzo Ball has been able to do for his career. We also know Lonzo was known as one of the worst three-point shooters in the league and then became low-key one of the better and more consistent ones in his very short Chicago Bull days and end of Pelicans days. There's no reason why Castle couldn't at least try to imitate that and become what Lonzo Ball was supposed to be for the Chicago Bulls before the injury. So I think this is a great decision by them and they could really go from having not many good quality, you know, things at the point guard position to having Lonzo Ball and Castle in. That is a massive, great and big up for this Chicago Bulls team. Now, with the 11, uh, with the 12th overall pick, sorry, we do have the Oklahoma City Thunder, who I've actually got them taking the exact same dude I had them taking last year in Kyle Filipowski, if you're wondering, how the hell did you have them taking him last year if he didn't, uh, of course, get drafted at all? And what happened was, is Filipowski decided to, like, the last second whether he wanted to be an NBA player or not, or stay one more year in college, and he decided to stay one more year in college. And it's kind of weird because in a much weaker draft class, his stock really hasn't gone up that much. But to be honest, I still low-key feel like he would be a very good player to bring in for this OKC team as they have filled out nearly every position with really young talent, except I think the center position. Other than Chet Holmgren, they don't have a lot there or what they probably need and I think the reality is I still think Chet could be like spend minutes at power forward throughout his career uh, just because of how versatile he is and I think having him and Filipowski share minutes together is a very responsible and easy thing to do but also Filipowski potentially being a very good backup center for them with this 12th overall pick it, again it's being said that Kyle Filipowski is a multi-talented seven foot center who can also potentially spend some time at the powerful position being a very special player recruited to duke for 2022 being and staying back for another two years that's being said that he's also a slick ball handler an excellent passer for a big man who can also shoot the ball his floor spacing will be the most coveted skill in the nba level cole has good mobility but isn't a big time run and jump athlete and will have to prove he can handle defense in the NBA. It's said that he will have to max out his defensive abilities if he wants to have a long career. Again, that's definitely a, a big knock. A ton of other reports and scouts here do say that he's not a good rim protector at all and his presence is definitely not felt in the paint. But again, with how we're looking at Filipowski, I know his defense does suck, which is not good for a center at all. It's completely the reason his draft stock just, I guess, hasn't gone up. But if we're going to look at, of course, the positives here, this dude is an offensive beast. And Oklahoma right now are one of the best defensive teams in the league. Can they afford to sacrifice some defense by having Filipowski on the court? Maybe so. But at the same time, he's an offensive beast who I'm not going to call the early bird and say he's got some similarities to Nikola Jokic because I feel like we say that with about 10 centers in every draft now. But again, there are some tiny similarities in terms of his passing and ball handling for a big is actually pretty good. Like if you give this guy the ball, he's not going to poo his pants on the court and do something absolutely stupid that I definitely think a lot of centers have been pretty notoriously known to do in the NBA. But again, if you're sending this guy out on the court and you're just telling him, look, 
we need we need rebounds now. We need a backup presence from Holmgren. We need a guy who can absolutely tear it up offensively, who can pass, who can shoot well, and who can scare, uh, who can score us the ball. You take that if you're Oklahoma. Another guy again, Alfred Shengun, who's a man that people forget has not been notoriously known as being the greatest defender, especially in his first year. It was a massive knock that Shengun was this six foot nine center who couldn't defend the ball at all. But now he's, I think, six foot eleven. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm pretty sure he grew like very recently, or at least that some of the reports were saying. But again, that guy can do a lot of things that Filipowski, hopefully, should be able to come in the NBA and do. And with such a decent-sized hole for them at center position, if you can fill this out, not only having Holmgren as your starting five, but also Filipowski as the backup center and maybe get another veteran center in, like they had Mike Muscala for so many years... That's a that's a massive bonus that I think uh, Oklahoma will will definitely like. And the thing is as well, as I mentioned earlier, the versatility of maybe having this guy play center minutes and then having Chet at the powerful position is pretty interesting. It's maybe not something that OKC would do with... I, I feel like them are being a little bit more fast-paced than that. They like to get down the court a fair bit and spread the ball again that's that's their thing is if you don't have giddy in the starting lineup usually everyone's a really consistent shooter so again that's the interesting thing about oklahoma city is the josh giddy situation what will they do there because he's not the greatest shooter at all thing is though giddy really just helps them with their playmaking and is low-key one of the best and most skilled playmakers in the whole entire nba so if you're adding filipowski here to a big man who can pass the ball. That just so fits into as well what I think this Oklahoma City Thunder team is about. We've just, like, everyone on this team can pass the ball. Like, it's just how it's set up. I see people saying, well, SGA is the point guard of this team, right? Well, yes, he's the point guard, but it's like Josh Giddy's the point guard, you know? And then you've got Chet Holmgren, who I've seen that dude play point center. Everyone on this team can basically pass the ball to a very, very good and high standard. And it's just absolutely great basketball to watch every time you watch Oklahoma. And I th I, that's why I think, again, Filipowski, he's passing, he's ball handling, and how he goes about his offense. To me, it fits Oklahoma. I said it last year, and I'll say it again. With how their coach goes about their style, that's how I think it should be. And I think as well... Having a guy like this who can play you 15 to 20 minutes per night off the bench as your backup center is a good, solid thing. And the thing is, too, he's not an 18-year-old like Bilal Kulabali, who you're bringing in. He's not a 19-year-old. I believe this guy is 20, 21 years old. So you're bringing in a more experienced rookie into this team, which also fits their where they want to go right now, which is, of course, wanting to now compete because they've built one of the best young cores in the NBA that is trying to currently win a championship as we speak. So Kyle Filipowski is a great move by Oklahoma in my opinion and that's why I have him going with the 12th overall pick. Now with the 13th overall pick we have the Sacramento Kings who this is a really really tough pick because I think Sacramento are pretty good on a lot of things. They've got a couple of young guys who are, are still coming through. They, of course, ha have a couple other things here and there going on that we obviously know. Um, some players might not be on this team. They might be traded. Some players might leave. We'll see how Malik Monk goes next season. Uh, will he return free agency? Not too sure. But with this 13th overall pick, it's hard to say what they need at this time, just because I think there will be a couple of different movements for Sacramento. But with, with pick 13, I kind of decided to go best available and what I think they might need. And that is, of course, Reed Shepard, who is a very tough player to, to put in this draft. Because even though I've got him going 13 to Sacramento, a lot of people have him ranked at pick 7. And the thing is, he is the best shooter in this draft class to buy an absolute 
mile. This dude, he could come into the NBA straight away and be one of the best shooters. And with, as I said, Sacramento, will Malik Monk come back? I'm not exactly too sure. They have a couple other point guards slash guards that might be getting moved through trades, through free agency, this and that. I figured there's a, there's a six foot three dude right now who is currently balling up in college for Kentucky, who is not only the best shooter in this class, but is, is an extremely good playmaker, a very good shot creator who is super crafty when he has the ball in his hands, especially around the perimeter. He's got excellent hands on defense. He can strip the ball away from anyone. He's pretty good at guarding point guards and smaller shooting guards. He's super smart and he just knows how to play the modern day game. Again, Reed is a unique talent. He's a bit of an undersized player for the point guard, uh, oh, shooting guard position, sorry. He is an elite athlete, but just his great ability with the ball in his hands to be one of the best shooters in all of college, which should translate to the NBA, is insane. He's got a solid frame, decent movement skills, and is actually pretty decent around the rim. And he's, I think, secret is he can also play make. There are, of course, some issue, uh, issues with Reid Shepard that kind of make me like, well, can he fit in the NBA? Like, because we know he's shooting and his offense is going to be so NBA level perfect. But his size and how he plays might be a question. And what I mean by that is, as I said earlier, he's a six foot three, probably going to have to be a point guard in the NBA. But the way he plays, he plays like a shooting guard. As I said, he's a very good defender when he's guarding the point guard positions earlier. Extremely good hands and does pretty well at guarding that position. Unfortunately, sometimes, especially when he gets switched on to small forwards or just a taller shooting guard, it is a nightmare for him. You got a six foot three dude who is a decent defender, as I just said, who would have to potentially guard, you know, a, a six foot six to six foot eight shooting guard slash small forward in the NBA. He just gets absolutely torched every time and this is where I was a bit scared because I was like is Mike Brown who is such a good defensive coach one of the league's best you know I, I think will he be able to have a guy like Reed Shepard again Mike Brown has become a pretty good offensive coach I think in his time too some might even know him for that now but with how I see it it does scare me a little bit having a dude like Reed Shepard in this team just based off his defense not being great. But as I mentioned earlier, there will be movement with this Sacramento team. They've got Fox at the one, like I said, Kevin Herter at the two as their main guards. But if I remember right, Kevin Herter did recently just get injured. I'm not exactly too sure for how long, but I think he'll, he'll definitely play, um, uh, I think, the majority of next season. I think he's getting shoulder surgery, so... We'll have to see how he goes with there. But as I, as I said, Malik Monk, he's going to get a ton of contract offers. I expect him to come back, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was to potentially see a massive offer from another team and be gone. Chris Duarte, I don't know if he will be on this team for much longer. I don't know if I really rate him as a player. Davion Mitchell as well. He could definitely get traded. It just really hasn't worked out that much on this Sacramento Kings team. So there will definitely be a massive hole for them to go out and look for some more, I think, guards, depending how a lot of this free agency and trade period does play out. Reed Shepard is a scoring machine who is an elite shooter, who you're always going to love. And with pick 13, you're not going to expect to get some game-changing player, especially in this draft, which has been so noted to be such a weaker draft. You might just have to bite the bullet and, and bring in a guy like... Reed Shepard because he he is such a great offensive player. Again, his defense might not fit the Sacramento Kings team, but I think bite the bullet and see how you go because I think the upside for the Sacramento Kings team with Reed Shepard in it is very good. And it takes a ton of pressure off your team if Malik Monk leaves because then you can say, well, we got a great scoring guard off the bench now who is an elite shooter who can just completely make up for that. And then if Malik Monk decides to stay, well, having him and Malik Monk on the court together at the same time would be so beautiful to watch offensively. It would not be funny for a lot of other NBA teams. Now, with the 14th overall pick, 
we do have the Portland Trailblazers, who, again, previously, I did have them selecting Martez Bazoulas, who I think can be one of the best players in this class. I've seen some people even have that guy at pick one. I had him going at pick five earlier, obviously, to the team. But with a 14th overall pick, I will have them selecting Jacoby Walter out of Baylor. Again, this guy is a great three-point shooter, which I think they desperately need in this Portland Trailblazers team. He's being said to be one of the best in the whole entire draft. He's a decent shot creator who has a ton of upside in the NBA. He's got a great motor, really competitive defender who some believe could turn into being one of the best defenders in this draft class. A very, very good player if his development does pan out. Again, he's a six foot five, six foot six, I believe, shooting guard wing, who I definitely think can add some nice scoring for this Portland Trailblazers team. Again, if you're looking to use him as a point guard, completely forget it. Reports say that he can't handle the ball really at all, and he does struggle a lot as a playmaker. He, he, he just really, I think, has that, I, I think, ability to be a good role player in this NBA. A player like KCP, who he's compared to, who KCP does not get enough credit. A starting wing for the Lakers in their championship year, a elite defender who can shoot really well, as well as being a championship player for the Denver Nuggets. That man is what you want to be if you want to be a role player. KCB being severely underrated for his whole entire career thus far. Again, Jacoby Walter, if you can ask this man to come in and do what KCP has done, guard the shooting guard, guard the small forward position while being an elite three-point shooter on this Portland Trailblazers team. It fixes a ton of the problems that they have. It says Walter is the prototypical two-guard who has size and great tools to be a high-level talent in the NBA. He is a skilled shot maker with deep range on his, jump, uh, on his jumper and a very good shooting form. He has a really smooth release and puts great rotation on the ball. His outside shot is the most intriguing NBA skill he has. Again, as, as I said, Walter, he's not exactly the greatest playmaker. Ball handling can be a question sometimes. But as I mentioned earlier as well, he competes on both ends on defense. He doesn't take plays off and is always the most aware defender on the court. He has the tools to not only be a good defender, but a great defender and should really convert over to the NBA. He's a pretty good athlete, maybe not NBA standards, but uh, again, KCP, some might beg to differ on him as well. And I just really think he could be what KCP has kind of become now in this league. And that's really all you can ask for. A lot of those players are making a ton of money. We just saw Grayson Allen re-sign for like 20 million the other year, which is, yeah, that's, that is, a, oh, the other day, sorry. That's a lot of money. It was like 15 to 20. And that guy does a lot of things really good. Elite shooter who has definitely improved much more on defense. Jacoby Walter just needs to come in with the mindset that I can be a great defender in this NBA while also being a very good and capable shooter. But of course, if you haven't already, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Comment your thoughts and opinions down below, guys. What do you think? about this official 2024 NBA mock draft lottery. Again, highly recommend you guys go and check out my previous video where I do, of course, do the top 10. Uh, that way, again, you'll see who I have all the other teams selecting with higher picks. Again, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for all the latest sports content and news, my gaming channel, and my IRL slash long channels. Links for them will be in the description down below. But as I was saying, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and comment. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.